This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Don't let your kids watch it! Hey there, Artie! Alright. If the internet sources that I consulted that were spoiler-free are correct, this is the final chapter now. It's probably going to be the longest one, but we're making good time. The body wasn't there. The police didn't arrest me because of that, but I didn't know whether to feel happy about it. Just like Satoko had said, I had failed to kill her uncle. The body wasn't there, so I was forced to conclude as much. No matter what strange natural disaster, coincidence, or miracle it might have implied, in order to free Satoko, I became a demon. And this abnormal world was my reward. Yes, metaphorically, I had fallen into the demon world. But if that price had been in exchange for the life of Satoko's uncle, then that would have been fine. Since Satoko's uncle was still alive, still shackling her to him, I needed to become a demon once again. Oh no. Oh, one more time. Now, no. As many times as it took. I would kill that man over and over again until Satoko is liberated. Okay, well, dude, you're being maybe a little bit melodramatic about this one. If they covered it up, it would be nice if they straight up told... Yeah, that's true. But maybe they don't want him to rat them out, and they think he might rat himself out. I had already awoken. I looked at the clock to see that it was early in the morning, at just about five. It was already light outside. Once I'd hardened my resolve to become a demon again, I could feel my whole body teeming with the awakened power once more. Time wasn't an issue. No matter what, I'd do it. I got myself up. The exhaustion from the past two days was completely swept away, and I didn't even feel sleepy anymore either. I slowly rose and made sure my body was moving like I wanted it to. I could feel blood flowing through each and every one of my fingers. Oh, you know what might happen? Okay. I'm going to make a prediction before anyone else that does anything. He's going to just flat out... He, at this point, he's go, he's so far gone, and he doesn't care anymore. He's just going to go right to their house and kill the uncle there. He's either going to... And again, I still believe he killed the uncle the first time. I think he's going to go see the uncle, kill the uncle, and it's going to turn out it wasn't the uncle, it was Satoko. I think he's going to end up killing Satoko, and then just completely lose it, and it's going to end that way. That's what I'm thinking. <sighs> I could feel blood flowing through each and every one of my fingers. As I got dressed, I, left my, I let my mind wander, and had a strange thought. These two days, while I've said it was for Satoko's sake, the only thing on my mind has been killing. I've said it was for Satoko, but while actually carrying out the act, I had completely forgotten about Satoko, albeit only temporarily. Maybe, initially, it was for Satoko's sake, but now I... I was just a demon, killing for the sake of killing. And as a result, I'd sunk into a world fit for such a demon. <sighs> Maybe it was the same for Satoshi. He resolved himself to kill his aunt to save Satoko, became a demon, and then disappeared from the sunlit Hinamizawa, vanishing into the demon world. It would be interesting if there was, like, a parallel Hinamizawa... For, like, that was demon human. That would actually be interesting. I don't think that's the twist they're going for, though. Which meant that after all was said and done, I'd met the same fate as him. I'd tried to avoid making the same mistakes, but it happened anyway. Which meant that maybe Satoshi was here. Satoshi had come to this world a year before me, so he would be here somewhere. We crazy. Then, surprised, I stopped walking. The tip said something about pushing someone into the ground or off a cliff. I think Satoko was referencing... Um, I thought when I was reading it that she was referencing finding an, a way that she could kill her own uncle. I guess I don't know for sure, but that's what it sounded like to me. There was the second set of footsteps I'd grown so used to hearing. The empty, lifeless air wouldn't give me an answer. But I felt a strange kind of relief that there was someone there, that Satoshi had stuck with me the whole time. Let's go, Satoshi. Once more. This time we will set Satoko free for sure. I don't think you're going to. I quietly slipped out of the house so my parents wouldn't notice. If they caught me now, ahead of when I'd been out way too late for two days now, they'd give me a really angry talking to. I'm sorry, but what about Coach calling my, our parents and the police station that we are crazy and that he wants to give us a psychiatric evaluation? Did Coach just forget about that? Was Coach like, oh, I'll, I'll tell the police. I'll tell him that he escaped and that he's crazy and that he killed somebody and they'll take care of it. And then Uisi's just like, nah, I don't care. I just want to find a body. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
Yeah, that's true. If Satoko went crazy and she wanted to kill someone, like, nothing would really stop her. She could definitely put get some fatal traps going. If they caught me now, well, yeah, they'd give me a really angry talking to. I didn't have the time to allow for that to happen. Today, I would put an end to it. If the dead body disappeared, then I didn't have to bury it. I could just burn it to ashes, then take them with me, so I could kill again every time he resurrected. I'd do it again. I'd kill him again. And this time I'd set her free. Outside, the morning light was so beautiful as to stagger belief. Unless Eerie died that night. I don't think so. Why? What would have killed him? The police? Why would they do that? I went to the storage room to find weapons with which I could kill him for sure. Blunt or not, it didn't matter to me. Right now, I didn't need to care whether someone saw or if the police came. This world had gone crazy after all. A world where I'd shown up at the festival and had fun, even though I wasn't there. Even if the police arrested me, I'd probably end up going right back home as if nothing had ever happened. Both me and this other Keiichi Maibara. Even without me, he'd fill in. I could vanish from Hinamizawa without anyone noticing. So basically, I didn't care if I was mistakenly killed. Even if I died, Keiichi Maibara would remain. After all, this isn't the world I belong in. If I was going to be killed mistakenly for Sotoko's sake, then that was just part of my duty as her nini. See, normally I would be criticizing how stupid he is, but I know he's legitimately going insane here, so, I mean, I've just kind of accepted it. I know, like I said, if Coach just didn't make creepy jokes about underage kids' skin, then he would literally be one of my favorite characters. <sighs> and those desperate thoughts became serious, and the morning air felt more refreshing to me, strangely enough. <laughs> it was a hatchet meant for chopping thick firewood. Wait, that's what Rena had. Its hefty steel blade was sinister, almost as though it was a tool meant for killing people. Hmm. At least he's not dead. I mean, like, they couldn't get a transmission signal from him, but that doesn't mean he's dead. I couldn't exactly take it out in public like that, so I wrapped it a little in some old newspaper and tossed it into the basket on my bike. Plus, I don't believe he has a b the ability to make a wish to, for someone to die for that to actually happen. That was just coincidence that it happened with Takano because she was going to fake her own death anyways. <laughs> the poor bike doesn't deserve this. I apologize to my bike for some reason. For the past three days, I've only used it for dangerous things. I'd been riding this bike ever since I lived in my old town. I could walk most places I wanted to go, so I hadn't used it all that much. My mom had bought it for me when I entered cram school, thinking it would be a convenient way to get to the station since it was far away. So I'd always used it to get back and forth from cram school. I'd only ever put textbooks and class materials in the front basket, too. I'd never tried to put a hatchet that I'd be using to kill someone in there. You haven't? You should try it. When I came to Hinamizawa, life finally felt fun. I met the best friends ever, and had some of the greatest times ever. Those times might have been shattered now, but it was my greatest wish that I could get them back, even if I had to risk my life to do it. That's how fun those times had been. I killed someone. And now that I was at it again, needing to kill someone. Murder was a crime. I didn't believe that people should ever think murder was okay. But still. The times I had were enjoyable enough for me to commit such a crime. My friends were irreplaceable, and the time spent with them a treasure. Hanging out, laughing, sometimes tricking each other, but always in a friendly way. I didn't fear committing any crime, as long as it was for the sake of taking back those times that gave my heart so much pleasure. It is interesting he feels this strongly about his friends. Like, I appreciate that. That's also something foreign to me, because I feel like... <laughs> no matter how good friends I am with someone, I'm not going to commit murder for them. Maybe that would change if I ever had, like, a daughter or something, but... Yeah. Hmm. Yes. <sighs> this was a value that I decided to uphold. Well, th th again, that's possible. Maybe he did die. Wow, like, if so, literally everyone's dying. This is almost as bad as Chapter 2. It wasn't something I learned from a school teacher. It was a noble path that I chose for myself. I thought back to when I'd first come to Hinamizawa. About how on the very first day, Satoko had welcomed me via a blackboard eraser with a rock in it. That welcome really surprised the heck out of me. She would laugh, get angry, cry. She was never boring. She was obviously the most childlike one among us. Boom, 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 boom. But she was actually lively, full of vim and vigor, and good at meddling in other people's business. That went for Mion, Rena, and Rika, too. Yay! 
Friends, near and far away. Wasn't Satoko the one at the center of everyone's laughing and banter? Satoko would try to look cool. Then Mion would make fun of her endlessly. Then Satoko would cry, which would put Rena in a state of ecstasy. Rika would be greatly delighted. And I happened to get mixed up in it. We would always fool around like that. It was lonely when someone wasn't around. But if I had to name one for whom it was the worst, it would have been Satoko. Her smile was everyone's smile. And ever since she stopped smiling, so did the rest of us. And for the rest of us, not smiling was the same as dying. It was just like when I was going to silently go to cram school every day, just to maintain my unchanging test scores. Okay, the one thing, DX, that you did predict that I don't see happening is the town getting nuked at the end, where you're like, they kept talking about the end of the world. I think it's going to be end of the... I don't think so. I think that was more metaphorical. I ain't said that. If that actually does happen, like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be wholly impressed. Hmm. So, basically, we were nothing when she wasn't smiling. She was full of hot air, but she was our princess. Cute and unhateable. Uh, well, I don't know about that. I feel like uh, Rika would be the princess. But in that case, I was her knight, searching for the dragon's castle in order to win her smile back. <laughs> but they also use lances? Haven't you played Fire Emblem? Guys, it's insane! Yeah. Then I saw an old person in the ridge of a field waving to me. Oh yeah? Kichi kun kai. Asa no cycling kai ne. Ohayou gozaimasu! I reflexively waved back in a refreshing way. Should I really have been feeling so happy waving like that? Satoko's house would be right past this road, going beyond the rice paddies. <laughs> the cicadas had woken up too. And the next thing I knew, I was the audience to their daily chorus. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. I gave myself a hint or a hit or two in the head and drove away in my merry morning mood. I took a deep breath, then tilted my head back, quelling my pointless excitement. The body wasn't there. Its absence either meant my killing him had been an illusion, or that I'd killed him and he'd risen from the dead. Or someone else moved the body. If I was at the festival, then maybe I should have considered it an illusion. Coach probably thought that way, which is why he treated me like a lunatic. I, you are! But it being an illusion was just impossible. I killed him without a doubt. Without a doubt! If that had been an illusion, then that would make all of this Hinamizawa I was in right now an illusion. If that was the case, then that's how it would end up. I mean, to be fair, it's going to be really hard to come to the conclusion that you are genuinely insane and that your brain's not working properly. I don't know how I would ever come to that conclusion. So, like, I get it. I was actually in a vegetative state due to a traffic accident, and I was currently dreaming in a hospital bed about how great it would be to spend time with my friends in rice paddies like these. That was a terrifying thought, though. If this wasn't an illusion, then the only possible answer was that he'd resurrected. It would make him a literal monster. But if he was such a monster, then I was no less a monster myself. I didn't hesitate to kill someone, and I would even wield curses. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Takano-san had probably died because I'd cursed her. Nope. <laughs> or maybe that was just a little much. If Coach Anuisi died too, like I'd cursed them yesterday, then I'd believe it. Uh-oh. I set my bicycle aside and went to take a look. His motorbike wasn't here. Of course it wasn't. I sent it down to hell that night, throwing it into the Onigafuchi Swamp. Or maybe, just like how the corpse wasn't here, maybe the motorbike didn't get thrown into the swamp either? The fact that his bike wasn't here might have been because he had gone to town and hadn't come back. Not necessarily because I'd thrown it into the swamp. If he's like, I'm going to wait in his house, wait for him to return, and then kill him as soon as he goes in, he's definitely going to kill Satoko by mistake. If her uncle wasn't around, then that was convenient on its own. Then I would just show myself in, then wait for him to return, sharpening my hatchet. This is exactly what he's going to happen. Yep. If, if he was there. Forgotten sensations came back to my gut. A feeling of tension rose within me. The sensation was like poison, dulling my actions, but it also could be the trigger to allow me to awaken my, to my superhuman, overworldly self. I held the hatchet, still wrapped in newspaper. Its weight in my hands was profound, sinister, and reliable. I hadn't put on my watch, so I didn't know what time it was, but it was probably still a little before seven. Satoko would probably be awake, preparing breakfast and her lunch, but her uncle would probably still be lazing around in bed. 
A guy like him would probably have stayed up late drinking and probably always slept until noon. I considered ringing the doorbell and having Satoko open the door for me, but if her uncle woke up at the sound, I'd waste my chance of him being still being asleep. If Satoko saw me sneaking around inside without ringing the doorbell, she'd be surprised. If I ran into her, what would I say? I've come to kill your uncle for you, so stay quiet. No, I couldn't do that. That would be like making Satoko responsible for his death. Be quiet and go wait outside. Maybe that would do it. How would Satoko react to that? She would probably try and get me to give up on killing him. I would have to lie somehow to get her to go outside. Satoko didn't need to know that a murder was going to occur in this house. I couldn't quite think of a good lie to tell her, but I couldn't do much just standing around like this. What if he just sees Satoko? <laughs> Does he think he'll be... Yeah, well, it's still wrapped in newspaper, so she might not know what it is. I made up my mind and grabbed the doorknob. You're so stupid. I get it, he's insane. Then slowly turned it and pulled. It wasn't locked. The gap between the door and the wall steadily grew larger. Why didn't he lock the door? I mean, I say that like he's alive. The chain wasn't even on. The oppressive smell of life in Satoko's house hit me. At the entrance, there were a few pairs of shoes and sandals. I couldn't tell whether he was there or not just by looking at them. I could hear a television on somewhere. The television was in the messy dining room. Oh, doesn't this look like a picturesque place to live? There was food scattered around the table, giving an impression decidedly different from a happy family's mealtime. Meals were for eating food while thanking the person for making it. Meaning whatever occurred in this dining room wasn't a meal. Nobody in sight. No sign of anyone, either. But with the television on, he must have been close. Could he have anticipated my coming and be hiding, waiting for me? The tension I felt was so thick, so tight that I thought it would choke me. The newspaper wrapping the hatchet's thick blade didn't hamper its power at all. I tightened my grip on it, then very carefully took a look around. Where are those peaceful feelings from before I arrived here gone? Even the sound of the sweat bubbling up on my brow got on my nerves. Is it really going to be over this quickly? And then, I looked at the table and realized something. This wasn't breakfast. The grains of boiled rice were all hard and dried up. Then, was it last night's dinner? I left the dining room, keeping vigilant, went down the hallway, and found the stairs on the second floor. When that man was playing with his friends, he looked out of a second-story window. It was highly possible that room was his own, and that he slept there. I tiptoed up the edges of the stairs, quietly, quietly climbing, without making a sound. I couldn't hear any kind of snoring. I didn't hear anything up here. I went through a few rooms, slowly and quietly opening the paper doors, checking inside. But I still couldn't find anyone around. To search more efficiently, I got down on the floor and pressed my ear up to it. I could hear the television in the dining room, and a low hum, perhaps of boiling water. It was then that I started to harbor some feelings of suspicion. This house wasn't right. It seemed like people had been here since the TV was on, but it wasn't normal for nobody to be around this early in the morning. I silently descended the stairs and went back into the dining room. I looked at the food scattered about. Completely dried up rice. An overturned bowl of miso soup. The package for a side dish bought at the supermarket. I could tell Satoko had definitely been the one who made this. The food was far from Mion's perfection or Renta's gentleness, but it was sincere. Judging by how she cooked for me at my house, and from the type and amount of side dishes, I deduced the meal was from last night. The numbers stamped into the food package read 830620. Is that Satoko taking a bath? Maybe. June 20th, 1983. That was yesterday. And there was food for two. Which meant that this was last night's dinner, and Satoko's uncle would have been here then. Or, Satoko's crazy and thought her uncle was still there and bought two meals and made them. Stop it, KG. Don't even think about saying the word impossible again. Anyway, her uncle was here last night. That much was the truth. I don't think it was. He had found fault for, with Satoko's food, thrown the bowl of miso soup, and flung the rest everywhere. Hidden deep within my feelings of calm and composure was lit a flame of anger and a curse. Should I have ever shown this man any mercy? Bump. <laughs> I heard the sound again, the one from before, like a water boiler. What was it coming from? The first floor? But where? The bathroom, maybe? I could hear the noise coming from the other side of the frosted glass at the far end of the changing room. It had to have been the sound of the water boiler for the bath. Steam was enshrouding the glass door, and the heat from it was leaking into the changing room where I was standing, too. Oh, it's foggy! He's not going to be able to see! My misgivings deepened. People didn't normally take a bath this early in the morning. Lay off! 
If one did, then it would mean that in this house, time had been stopped ever since some moment last night. Was it being reheated? The water boiler in the bathroom had been active this whole time. I checked in the clothing basket and saw Satoko's familiar uniform stuffed in it. The uniform had stains of dried rice stuck to it. Certainly not something she could wear today. It was probably from the miso soup at the dinner table yesterday. I looked hard at the frosted glass, but I couldn't see anything through all the steam. And then, an electric surge ran through my mind, and a terrible premonition came over me. Could she? She couldn't possibly have been here since last night! That would be impossible! But no! In Hinomi's hour right now, nothing was impossible. I gulped audibly, then quietly pulled aside the glass door. Why? No! No, no, no! Hot, steaming air burst out of the slight opening. The fan wasn't on in the changing room, so it went completely white with the steam. Just as the hot vapor poured into the changing room, cooler air also flowed into the room with the bath. Um, is she cooking alive? Yeah? And I just heard, due to being hit by that air, a very weak moan. That was all I needed to know who it was. <laughs> No answer. Satoko was in the bathtub, surrounded by a thick layer of rising steam. The top half of her body was leaning over the edge of the tub, and she was passed out. The water boiler kept on making a whistling noise, as if angered. I could see the gas flame through a small window. It was roaring at full force, completely blue. Satoko's entire, entire body was boiled red and flaccid, as though her bones had melted away. Oh jeez! This is not where I was expecting the story to go. She was almost like a doll, as she laid unconscious. I wasn't sure how many seconds passed as I stared in complete bafflement. I came back to my senses and promptly shut off the boiler. I mean, it's on Steam. Steam, I think, as a rule, does not allow nudity. But then again, I also installed a mod, so... Hmm. No, no, I don't really need to look at that again. Um... You know, just in case, I have a black screen here that I can switch to, if necessary. Alright, I dragged her out of the bathtub. The water in it was as hot as the water in public baths. Was she in this boiling water for the entire night? She'll die. She'll die! Satoko's body was lighter than I expected as I laid her on the floor and wrapped her in a towel. I went back into the bathroom and opened up the vent, creating a path for a cool breeze to come through. Upon the breeze hitting her, Satoko moaned again. She is alive! <laughs> Jesus, please! This is horrifying. Satoko recognized me and muttered a response, but I couldn't really tell what she was saying. Her eyes were muddy and unfocused. I could tell she wasn't completely conscious. Upon closer inspection, her limbs and waist were twitching slightly. This was way worse than normal overheating. This is dangerously... Didn't they call this heat stroke? <sighs> think, think, what would a teacher do if a girl passed out in the middle of summer during a marathon in gym class or something? I turned the water faucet in the kitchen all the way on and soaked a towel in it. I then took the cold towel and pressed it to Satoko's forehead. Satoko reached harsh, reacted harshly to the coldness and let out a muffled voice. For burns? Right. You should soak the burn spot under running water. Then, could I run cold water in the shower and cool her off like that? No. If it was that sudden, it wouldn't be good for her heart, and she'd go into shock. I think I read that once before. <sighs> uh, this, this, this was about as much nursing as I could possibly give her. And even more than this would be too much for the likes of an amateur. What? No, 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 Satoko, it's 1,500, not 5,000. What? What was Satoko reciting under her breath? I brought my ear to her mouth to better make out the mysterious spell-like words she kept saying, and at that moment, I understood what they were for. Satoko, you're... People tell little kids in the bath to count to 100 a lot, right? Satoko was counting like that, but 5,039? What the crud? I doubted my ears, and I doubted her common sense. I doubt your common sense, too. To 10,000? 
this explains the hint we got. Apparently her uncle was telling her that she's smelly and needs to take longer baths, and that's probably what she did. Last night, her uncle flew into a rage at the dinner she'd made, saying it stunk and was inedible. Satoko didn't understand what on earth he meant. It wasn't much different than what she usually made for him. Maybe he hated the smell of the pickled vegetables she bought in particular? Her uncle then decided the stink was originating from Satoko and shouted at her that she never ever took baths. And then... He put Satoko in the boiling water and told her not to come out until she counted to... Alright! Alright, Keiichi, that's an impressive scream you did there. Okay, you can stop now. Wow. You, you gotta give it to whoever voice acted Ke Keiichi. He, he gave 110% to it to this. I snapped and exploded. Yeah, you didn't need to tell me that! I heard it. Raising the newspaper-wrapped hatchet, I stampeded for the house. I searched for anything. Traces, signs, smells, vibrations, heartbeats. With a war cry, I raced up the stairs with such force I could have stomped a hole through them. Then I found the futon in the room I thought to be her uncle's. And well aware he wasn't sleeping in it, I bashed it with the hatchet. Yeah, I mean, that is true. That is true. Did he run into the closet? I'll bust the entire closet down, door and all! And if he's not there, maybe there's a secret door. Here's Keiichi! <laughs> and he switches her levers in the walls here. Okay, just don't accidentally kill Satogo, that would be bad. I smashed into wall after wall with the hatchet, crushing them. Dust rose into the air, and broken pieces scattered about the floor. I smashed all the glass windows, too, for good measure. Th there's no need for that! It just... This is the guy who says, How dare the coach think I'm crazy? I'm completely normal! He's crazy. The world is crazy. <laughs> Let me show you how normal I am. After I destroyed everything beyond recognition in her uncle's room, my reason finally kicked in and suppressed my emotions. Anyway, her uncle wasn't in the house right now. I'd have to leave killing him until later. Right now, I had to do something about Satogo. I went back to the changing room. Satogo was still lying limp on the floor. There was nothing more than an amateur like me could do for her. I needed to take her to the clinic. Coach had treated me like a lunatic yesterday and tried to lock me up in a mental hospital. I never wanted to see his damn face again. But still, I needed to go to the infirmary. infirmary. I needed to go to the infirmary one more time. I needed to have a doctor look at Satoko. I thought about putting her in the dirty uniform lying in the laundry basket, but I had no experience dressing someone, so it would be pretty difficult. Shit! I don't have time to be wasting here. I eventually gave up on clothing her and decided to carry her in her bath towel. Okay, at least she's got a towel on. The clinic was close to Satoko's house. It would be way faster to carry her there than to call 119 and get an ambulance. Not to be confused with 911. <laughs> I threw the biggest towel I could find over her and prompted her to stand. Her words sounded clearer than before. She was starting to come back. I cried tears of relief just knowing she'd improved even a little bit. Satoko turned over so she was lying on her face, and then put up a weak struggle to get up on a knee. Okay, maybe it's not going to end right away. <laughs> I thought Chapter 12 was going to end like immediately, because I thought for sure he was going to kill Satoko accidentally, but maybe he still will, but at least not now. I smoothly swept her up and put her on her ba my back. The towel I put on her seemed like it was about to fall off. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm not parading you outside in the nude. It didn't hurt one bit to carry Satogo. She was light. Too light. The lightness actually made me uneasy. Outside, it had gotten hotter, as though eager to attack Satogo. Fucking cicadas! Why did you have to choose this morning to get so hot out? Why are you blaming the cicadas for the weather? I didn't have time to swear at them. You, you did in your head. The clinic was this way. Hoisting Satogo on my back, I broke into a trot. Jeez, I almost broke my chair there. 